Today's daf we're going to learn is Yoma Nun Aleph. You should also be looking not only at the, the sheet, but also there's pictures more for the end of the daf. Okay. Um, I want to do a review of yesterday's daf. Both was a little bit complicated, and it's going to be important to set up what we're doing today. So quick review. We started with a question, forgetting about the par and kola par. We're not going to go all the way back to there. But we started with this, these two opinions of Rav, uh, sorry, Rava and Rav Amram about whether we consider the par Yom Kippurim, right, the bull offering of the Kohen, which he does for himself and the Kohenim. Is it a korban sibor? Is it considered a communal offering because it includes all the Kohenim? Or is it considered an individual because it's really Aharon's korban and yet it includes Kohenim also. Kohenim aren't really a sibor, or maybe it's really just Aharon's. So in the end, we, Rava says it's individual and Rav Amram said it's communal. Then we started bringing questions. Abai brought questions against Rava and said, but there's all these sources that seem to indicate that it's communal because rules of communal uh, sacrifices apply to it. And one of those was this question about Rabbi Elazar asked, according to the one who says that it's a Korban Yachid, can laws of substitution apply or not? Which meant that there are those who think it's Sibor. And in addition, there was another one that seemed to indicate that there is Sibor, to which Rava answers, anytime it says it's not yachid, it doesn't really mean it's not yachid. It doesn't, sorry, it doesn't mean it's communal, tzibor. It means it's this in between. It means it's shutafim. They're partners. So if we, for example, own a korban in partnership, also laws of tamura won't apply to that. It doesn't have to be communal for it to not apply. So he basically says anytime it seems to indicate it's tzibor, it doesn't really mean tzibor. It means partners. Okay. Yeah. The Gemara then wanted to go in depth into this question of Rabbi Lazar and try to get an answer to it. So if you hold, now the question is like this, if you hold its individual, like Rava, let's say, it is an individual offering. The question is, do laws of substitution apply? Laws of substitution apply only to an individual's korban. So do we view this, and this is this weird phrase in the Gemara, that that they are, this is what we said about like plaintiffs in a, in a class action suit, that they're all part of the suit. They're all part of the korban since they all receive atonement, which means we're going to call it a partnership, which means there's not going to be loss of tamura. Or do we say, bekufya mit kapre. He's really getting atonement, the kohen gadol. With him, he's going to bring a bunch of people, but it's really his korban. And that's going to be the whole debate that we're really discussing here. Is it his? And he just kind of includes people along with it. Or is it joint and owned equally by all of them? So to answer the question, we brought this Braita. And the Braita said that there's a Chumrah by Zevach but Tmur, that there isn't in Tmur. There's a Chumrah by Tmur, or there's three. There's one Chumrah in Tmur that there isn't by Zevach, right? That the, this is basically saying the original Koran versus the substitution of the Korban. So there's differences between them. Each one has their own stringencies. I'm not going to go into all the details again, but the main point here was that they tried to say, and I brought this all on the sheet just to start you off with, the summary, if you want to glance at the sheet. We want to know what's the subject of the Zevach side, right? What are we talking about when we say a Zevach? Zevach, we said, it's well, two of the three things are, it's Doche Shabbat and Doche Tumah. That would normally be a communal offering, as we saw yesterday. And, right, because Tumah Hutra B'tzibor, all that, or Dechuya B'tzibor. And it says, Oset Muran. Now, you can only do a substitution, I already told you, on an individual. So, Something doesn't make sense about this source. Either the Zevach is individual, and then it's not going to be Doche Shabbat and Doche Tumah, or it's communal, and then it's not going to be Oset Tumah. So how can we find something that's one and the same? Oh, it must be, this is referring to a very unique Zevach like ours, which has elements of, it's Doche Shabbat and Doche Tumah, not because it's communal, but because it's timely. Remember, we learned yesterday, it's not just about Sibor and Yachid. It's about Sibor is Doche Shabbat and Doche Tumah, but something that has to be done at a particular time, in which case we're going to say the subject of the Zevach part of this is Par Yom Kippurim. To which Rav Sheshet said, no, you can find a different case. It doesn't have to be the Par, and I'll prove to you why it's not the Par. He suggests it's the Ram offering of our own that's also individual, but also has to be done on Yom Kippur, and therefore it can override Shabbat and override impurities. The problem with Rav Sheshet, the Gemara says, is, but then this, if you're going to say the whole subject of this is the Zevach of the Ayil, of the Ram, and the Tmura of the Ram, well, the laws of the Tmura of the Ram are not applicable. 
because what's the, oh, sorry. This is his proof. He says, it has to be the ram. Sorry, this is his proof why it has to be the ram and not the bull offering. Because the second part of that Brita says, the Chomer Betmura, oh, sorry, the first part of it. The Chomer Bezevach is that it's Doche Shabbat and Doche Tumah, which is not true by Tmura. Now, what does it mean it's not true by Tmura? That a Tmura sacrifice like this is not Doche Shabbat, is not Doche Tumah, but that implies if there's no impurity, and if it's not Shabbat, you would sacrifice it. Now, it happens that a Tmura of a sin offering, which is the bull, which is a sin offering, never gets offered on the altar. It's one of those unique cases where the Chamesh Chato Metot. So they say to Rosh Hashanah, says, this is my proof that it has to be the Ayel Leola, because the Ayel, the Tmura of an Ayel, could be go on the altar, and therefore it must be referring to that. To which the Gemara said, no, we can still prove it's the par, because only the first part of the Brayta, when it talks about the Zevach, is the par. The second part can be referring to, in general, Tmura, any kind of Tmura, okay? And it's not specific to this particular type. It just means for in general can be sacrificed. It's true. One can't, but in general it can be sacrificed. So then the Gemara said, well, I don't understand. If you're going to say tzmura means in general, then why do you say zevach means in general? And that's where we ended. So now they're going to say, shame zevach lo katani. You can't put a general category of zevach on this first part of the bright. Why? Because we're starting now from the bottom of Nur Amubet, mimai, mi de katani chomer b'tzmura, shatzmura chala abamum kavua, what do we say about the Tmura? That the Tmura goes on a Baal Mum Kavua, meaning if I designate a blemished animal for a substitution, it has full Kedusha, what we call Kedusha Aguf. And when you redeem it, therefore, it can never be used for shearing or for working. That's not true for a sacrifice. A sacrifice that you say, I'm designating a blemished animal, your designation is really only it means you're designating the value. Since it can never go on the altar, it's not sanctified. This is the problem, though. This, you can't say zevach means all sacrifices, because this line is not true for all sacrifices. And we'll show you why. There's exceptions to the rule. And that's why zevach can't possibly mean all sacrifices. The ha'ika bechor u'maser. There's two ca- sacrifices, a Bechor and a Masir. The firstborn animal is supposed to go to the Kohen. Now that has Kedusha when? When does it become sanctified? As soon as it's born. Which means, whether it's blemished, whether it's not blemished, it's going to have Kedusha to goof. It, in and of itself, is going to be sanctified. So therefore, which means that if you redeem it, it's still going, right, you're going to have to redeem it because you can't sacrifice it still has sanctity. And even though you redeemed it, it can't be sheared and it can't be worked. Maser is the same thing. Why maser? Maser is you take the 10th animal. Why don't you just say it doesn't apply to a balmum? So they say, no, you count 10 animals and it says, lo yivaker bein tov l'ra. You can't specifically decide I'm going to take a bad animal or a good animal for maser behema. You can't kind of decide, oh, let's take the worst of my animals and that one I'll offer up. The point being that it, what does it mean? They, they darsh in there. What does it mean? Bad animal, blemished animal, meaning even a blemished animal gets, if it was the 10th one, you, what you do is right, you take them, you put them in the pen and you walk them out of the pen one by one. That's where we get it from Netana Tokef, Ma'avir Tsono Tachat Shivto. You take a shevet, a, a stick, and you count them and the 10th one becomes sanctified. Doesn't matter if it's blemished or not. So these are two examples which wouldn't fit into that mission, that brighta. Which means that you can't say that this is referring to Shem Zevach in general. So therefore, we're now going to say, again, to go against Rav Sheshet, we can suggest that maybe this Brita is referring to Zevach is specifically the par of Yom HaKippurim, in which case we're going to learn our answer to Rabbi Elazar, that it is Oset Mu'ah, because it says Oset Mu'ah. And the part about the Tmura on the other side that says, Ena Doche Shabbat which would imply, okay, it doesn't say it directly, which is why we don't really mind, but which would imply that on a regular day it would be sacrificed, and that can't be the par chatat, because it's a chatat, and the chatat wouldn't be sacrificed. That doesn't bother us, because 
There we just mean Tmura in general is not Toche Shabbat and not Toche Tumah, which would also be true, by the way, for the Chata, because it would never be sacrificed, even, even not on Shabbat, but also wouldn't be sacrificed at all. So that can all apply to all Tmurot, and therefore we can say that part is general, this part is specific to the Par Yom Kippurin, and that basically knocks out Rav Sheshet's proof how he knew it must be the Ayil, the Ram. So we don't really know what it is. We're just saying your proof doesn't hold because we could explain it in a way that also fits with the par. Okay? In which case, we still don't know is it Oset Mu'ar or is it not? Because we don't know is this bright to referring to the par or not. Um, okay, so again, it can't be Shem Zevach because Bechor Maaser are the exceptions and they wouldn't fit. Because they're Chal Abal Mum Kavua Ve'en Yotzin Lechulin Legazez Ve'Lehave, they also would fit more into the Chal of the Temura and therefore this wouldn't be true for them. Ela, shem zevach lo katangi. So therefore, you can't say zevach is general. So now they say, well, umash na tmura. Shem, right? So why then tmura don't we specify? They say shem tmura achati. That's because everything, as I said before, in that brighta applies to tmura. You can say about all of them, even the chatat, it's not no hegebit tzibor, there's no tmura by tzibor, it's not doche shabbat and tumua, and it's eno ose tmura. Okay, so therefore, right, a tmura on a tmura is irrelevant. So since that applies to all tmura, we can keep a general name, and therefore we can say the first part talking about the par, the second part about general tmura, and therefore, again, Rav Shesha, your proof that it has to be the ayel, because the inference from that second part doesn't make sense, the inference from the tmura of the Eno Doche Shabbat V'tumah, the inference being that it is sacrificed normally, though, if it's not Shabbat and it's not Tameh, that inference is only true for the ram, and it's not true for the bull, and that was Rosh Hashanah's attempt to prove. But we've rejected that. So there, so they say again, right? Shame to achati, but zevach ika bechor ika maaser. Okay, that's just repeating, reviewing the answer. Okay, that was the first part. So the first part was again just to be really clear about what's happening here. We had the question of Rabbi Elazar. We brought this bright to try to prove it to say that the subject of the bright is the par. We bring Rav Sheshed, who says, no, the subject isn't necessarily the par, which then wouldn't teach us anything about Tamura. And we brought his proof, we rejected his proof, but still we're left with these two answers of how to read that Braita, and then that would affect whether or not we say, if the subject's the par, then we have an answer to our question, because it says, Oset Tamura. If the subject isn't the par, then we don't have an answer to our question. Now the Gemara is going to ask a question on Rav Sheshed, who said that it's talking about the Ayo. Ule Rav Sheshed. Why specifically did you have to choose the ram of Yom Kippur? You could have chosen something else. You could have chosen the Korban Pesach. Because Korban Pesach has all those criteria. How so? We remember this from Pesach. If you learn Pesachim, we had a lot of dealing with, you know, the Korban Pesach is Hutar B'Tum'ah. If the majority of the people are Tameh, the majority of the Kohanim are Tameh, you can sacrifice it even if it's impure. And it overrides Shabbat. We obviously do the Korban Pesach on Shabbat. We had that this year where Yud Dalit Chab Shabbat. We didn't bring Korbanot. But on that year, then, you know, if they had a year like ours, they would have sacrificed the Korban Pesach on Shabbat. Ve Oset Mura. And there's substitution by Pesach. De Korban Yachidu. Because it's an individual Korban. So that would be a perfect, it would fit perfectly. You don't have to say it's the ram. If you want to reject and say it's not the par, why don't you bring this example? So the answer who says Korban Pesach is a Korban Yachid. And this is the topic we're going to deal with for the next little bit. Kasaval en shochatin a Pesach ala Yachid. If you remember, we saw this opinion in Pesachim. I think it was Rabbi Yehuda's opinion. I don't remember exactly, but I think so. But anyway, he said, someone said there, en shochatin a Pesach ala Yachid. Remember, Pesach is always done in groups. Again, Pesach is similar to this par Yom Kippur. It's sort of individual, it's sort of in groups, right? So now, Pesach is done in groups. What if you don't have a group? Are you allowed to bring it on your own? So, thank you for checking, Ruth. So, it's Rabbi Yehuda's opinion that says that Ein shochatina Pesach HaLeyachid. If you're by yourself, you can't slaughter it. It has to be done with at least two people. So, therefore, you can't say it's a Korban Yachid. And, therefore, it wouldn't work here. Okay? Because then it would be Oset Tmura. It wouldn't do Tmura because it's not a Korban Yachid. Right? Remember. Anything that's a shutafim, two people own a korban together, there's no laws of tamura. Probably because, right, you don't own it yourself. You can't substitute something in place if you're not the sole owner of it. It's like anything. 
right? You own something in partnership with someone. You can't decide to sell it, let's say, without consulting with the other person. So it's like the same thing. Substitution doesn't work if you part own it with other people. So we basically said, Korban Pesach is in a Korban Yachid. So now they suggest another possibility, though. V'nuchma Pesach Sheni. Pesach Sheni could be done, even if you hold, like Rabbi Yehuda, the Pesach Rishon can't be done as an individual. Pesach Sheni could be. But what's the problem? If you say Pesach Sheni, there's a problem because Midach Tuma. Tuma is Hutra, right? It says, Dochet HaShabbat Ve'et HaTuma. Now, Pesach Sheni can't be brought Bituma. So it doesn't work. That's, this bright, it doesn't make sense to substitute Pesach Sheni because it's not true. We're going to see, maybe it is true. That's going to be our next part. Is Pesach Sheni, can you do it if you're impure? Okay, it's an interesting question. We'll get to it soon. So now, since we're on this topic of Pesach Sheni and Pesach Rishon, is Pesach Rishon individual or Tzibor, right? Now we just said Pesach Rishon is Tzibor. Pesach Sheni can be considered individual. Okay, we're, so now we're going to say the following. If you recall, and I brought it on the sheet in case you don't remember, yesterday we had, I actually didn't say it clearly yesterday, I said it was all part of the Mishnah, but it's really a Mishnah and a, and a Tosefta, of Rabbi Meir and Rabbi Yaakov. If you remember, we had the Tanakama had said, we didn't see it inside, but Tanakama clearly said, Korban Sibor, right, what's the rule for what overrides Shabbat and overrides impurity? It's a communal offering, to which Rabbi Meir said, we had two ways of reading it, but then we read it this way. This, I'm reading it according to the Gemara's conclusion yesterday. Amarlo Rabbi Meir, if you have the sheet in front of you, it's at the chart at the bottom of the page. Rabbi Meir says to Tanakama, I'll give you three examples. Par Yom Kippurim, Chavitei Kohen Gadol Pesach, which are all Korban Yachid, and they're Doche Shabbat, and they're Doche Tumah. So your principle, that it, if it's Tzibur, it, doesn't, it overrides everything, but Yachid, you seem to imply, won't override. I'm going to show you there's three Yachid, individual offerings, that do override. And one of them, notice, is Pesach. Now, we just said Pesach is Tzibur, not Yachid, but here he says it's Yachid. Rabbi Yaakov and the Tosefta there, also relating to the same Tanakhama, says, I got a question from the other side. You said that individual offerings don't override. And you said that Tzibur always override. Now, I'm going to have a difficulty with the Tzibur always overriding. I'm going to give you three cases of Tzibur that don't override Shabbat and don't override impurities. So he says, Alo parhelem davar shel Tzibur, and Tzirei avodat azara, and Chagiga, that are korban Tzibur, and they're not toche Shabbat, and they're not toche Tuma. So, that's our question. No, uh, that, that's, sorry, that's their two approaches. Now, what comes out of this, and this is what Rav Huna Bereid Rav Yeshua is going to ask Rava. I'm only Rav Huna Bereid Rav Yeshua the Rava. Vitana, the author of these brightot, right, Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Yaakov, Maishna Pesach de Kare Korban Yachid, U Maishna Chagiga de Kare Korban Sibor. Why is Pesach a Korban Yachid and Chagiga a Korban Sibor? Now, what is Chagiga? Remember Chagiga we learned about? It. You would bring it with your Korban Pesach, remember? And you would also bring it, it was Chagigat Yudalid, that if you didn't have enough meat, you bring it with your Korban Pesach. And also on all the holidays in the morning of the first day of the holiday or the second day, right, throughout the holiday, you bring Korbanot Chagiga, extra meat sacrifice. Now, who brings them? They're not communal offerings, they're individual offerings. Individuals bring them to the Beit HaMikdash on the holiday. So why are they in the category of Tzibor? So they say, Imishum da'ati b'knufya, if it's because you bring them on days when lots of people are in the temple and there's lots of people bringing them and maybe sometimes people bring them together or something like that. Also, Pesach is brought in groups of people and during the rego when there's lots of people and they're exactly identical. So why on Rabbi Meir's list does Pesach appear with the individual offerings and does Chagiga appear with the communal offerings? So they're basically going to say, ah, Ika Pesach Sheni da'ati b'knufya, da'adilo ati b'knufya. And this is very similar to what we just said before, which is probably why they brought it here, because they're going to say, no, Pesach Rishon is really considered a communal offering, like the Chagiga. When it says Pesach here in the Mishnah of Rabbi Meir, he means Pesach Sheni, the second Pesach, which is offered individually. It doesn't come in groups. So Amar Lei, wait, but then something doesn't make sense. In Ken Yedochet HaShabbat Ve'et HaTumah. But then they're going to be overriding Shabbat and overriding Tumah. But we just said Pesach Sheni doesn't override Tumah. Now, what was this Mishnah saying? Rabbi Meir was trying to bring exceptions to the rule. Okay, I, I read your question very quickly, Shana, but I think I'll answer it in, in what I'm saying. Hopefully this answers your question. Of course, what Rabbi Meir and Rabbi Yaakov are trying to get at is it doesn't matter, Tzibur Yachid, it's all about time-related, time-sensitive or not time-sensitive. 
But what they're doing is they're going against Tanakam, who said it's all Tzibor Yachid. That's what determines if it's Doche or not Doche. And they're bringing exceptions to the rule to say, look, this is Yachid, and it does override. This is Tzibor, and it doesn't override. They're basically arguing against the Tanakama's claim there, right, his klal, his um, principle that he brought. So your principle doesn't hold, and then they both conclude the principle is it's time-sensitive or not time-sensitive. But the point is that Pesach is in the wrong place, basically. Pesach should be Tzibor if Chagig is Tzibor. Now, either you're going to say they're all individual or you're going to say they're all communal, but they should be one and the same. So they basically say when he said Pesach, Rabbi Meir, he meant Pesach Shein. But what's the problem? He brought this in the list of three things that are see, that are individual offerings, and yet they override Shabbat and they override Tuma. Now Pesach Sheni overrides Shabbat, but it does not override Tuma. Meaning, if you're Tame Pesach Sheni or you know the majority of the Kohen, you don't bring the Korban Pesach Betuma. Okay, we're actually going to see that there's a machloket about this, and that's what the answer is going to be. In Amar Le'in, Rav says to him, that's not a question because Kimanda Amar Dachi. There's an opinion that says, we're going to see, it's Rabbi Yehuda's opinion, that it, do, uh, that it does override impurity. Okay, if you happen to be impure, when it comes to Pesach Sheni, you can bring your korban. So now, I find this is a very interesting part of today's stuff, which is the logic behind their argument. Titania, Pesach Sheni docheta Shabbat ve'ino docheta Tumah. So they all agree that it overrides Shabbat. If the 14th of Iyar comes on Shabbat, you do the Korban Pesach. But if you're Tameh, or if the majority of the Kohenim are Tameh, or all, all those options of what Tumah could be overridden, then, or your, your meat is Tameh, then, according to Tanakama, it doesn't. You don't bring it. According to Rabbi Yehudi, you bring it anyway. My time is Tanakama. What's his logic? He would say to you, this is my logic, right? We don't really know, but we're assuming. The whole reason you didn't do Pesach Rishon was because you were impure. Now we're going to let you do Pesach Sheni when you're impure? It doesn't make any sense. If that was the case, we should have just let you do it in Pesach Rishon when it was the proper time. So the whole reason was so we wouldn't let you do it so you could do it in, in a pure way. So the fact that you're now impure, you can't do it. The only reason we let you do it was to get you pure. You messed up again? Sorry, no chance. For Rabbi Yehuda Amar Lecha, he'll say the exact opposite. Amar Kra, the Pesach says, Kechol chukata Pesach yasuoto. Pesach Sheni has all the same laws as Pesach Rishon, which means, Afilu Betuma, which means, since the Pesach Rishon can be done Betuma, Pesach Sheni can be done Betuma. Obviously, it's not exactly the same, because if you're Tamei Lamet, for example, on Pesach Rishon, you don't do it, even though, right, Tuma is Dechuya or Hutra on Pesach, it's allowed. That's in the case of the majority of the Kohenim, or the majority of the people, you know, all different issues, but the fact is, if you're an individual on Pesach Rishon, you can't. But when you get to Pesach Sheni, you can do it betuma. Why? It's true like what Tanakhama said. The Torah wanted to give you a second chance. They didn't want to say, okay, let's give him right away. No, your tummy now, let's push you off a month. Let's see what happens. We Right, we'd like you to do it betara. Lo zacha, but didn't work out because something happened. Yeah, send it to Then you do you get your second chance. Okay, so it's two interesting approaches here about whether right whether we say listen Pesach Sheni is just because you were tame and you have to be tahor and if you're not tahor no chance. The second option is a much more lenient right and a and an inviting one saying listen we understand things happen so we're going to try to do it in the ideal way. If you can't. So, Pesach Sheni comes along, you're allowed to do a Betuma. So basically, again, we go back to saying the Mishnah in Tmura of Rabbi Meir, where he said Pesach, wasn't really Pesach, because Pesach is not individual. He must have been Pesach Sheni. How could it be Doche Tuma? Oh, because it holds like Rabbi Yehuda that it is Doche Tuma. Okay. Now we're back to Rabbi Elazar. Again, just to summarize where we're at, because it's a little confusing, right? We finished off on this, or we didn't exactly finish, but we started with this question of Rabbi Elazar. If you hold that the par Yom Kippurim is an individual offering. Is it individual entirely and you can do a substitution? Or is it a partnership between the Kohen and all the, right, and all the Kohenim? In which case you can't do a substitution. It's still not Sibor, but it is, it is a partnership. We tried to find an answer from that, the, the Zevach com- comparison to Tamura comparison. It didn't really work. It could go both ways. Then we got off on a question from Sheshit who said that that source was the L of Yom Kippurim, And we tried to say, why don't you say it was Pesach Sheni? 
and then we said, because that doesn't fit, because it's not Dochetuma, in which we got into this whole thing, is Pesach Sheni Dochetuma or not? And we brought it from this Mishnah and Tosefta of Rabbi Meir and Rabbi Yaakov, and trying to compare the Pesach and Chagiga there, and in in the end, concluding that that Pesach must be Pesach Sheni, and it is Dochetuma, oh, well, that's because there's a machloket about that whole issue. Now we're back to Rabbi Elazar's question. And the approach now is going to be, why didn't you just simply bring the answer from here? V'tepukleh da'asher lo'am arachmanah. The Pasuk says, and not only does it say it once, it says it three times. When it talks about the par, the par hachatat asher lo, that belongs to him, specifically to the Kohen Gadol. And it says it three times. It says it in verse 6, v'ikriv aron et par hachatat asher lo, he brings the, cor- the par hachatat that's his, v'chiper ba'do ba'abito, and he atones for himself and his family. In Pasuk Yid Aleph, the exact same words appear. I'm not going to get into why they appear twice here. We're only focusing right now on the asher lo aspect. Exact same words. And then it says, So Asher Lo appeared three times, twice in verse 11 and once in verse 6. So they say, why don't you learn from here? Now, the Torah says Asher Lo, and it says it three times. What's it coming to teach you? It's coming to teach you, and we're going to read it from a Braita. The Kohen Gadol has to spend the money out of pocket for this parachatat. Right? Remember we talked about how he has to be wealthy because he has to bring the mincha kavitin every day and he also has to bring the par from his own money. How do we know this? Titania, now they're going to darshan the three asher lo's. Why does it have to say it three times? This is just to support what we just said. Asher lo, mishalo humevi, vilo mishal tzibur. Asher lo means he brings his own and not from communal funds. He brings it from his own money. Yeah, yeah. That would be enough. But they say, no, not necessarily. Well, we understand why it says it's his and not the community's because the community doesn't receive atonement from this animal. But maybe he should collect money from all of the other Kohanim and together they should buy this part because really they're getting atonement from it just like he is. Talmud Loma, Asher Lo. The second Asher Lo comes to say, right, the first one says, he and not the entire Jewish community, meaning, really, it wouldn't come from the Machatzida Shekel, right, from the Trumat HaLishka. Number two, Asher Lo, it doesn't come from joint Kohen funds. Now, what would the third be? We've already limited it to just him. But, Yachol Lo Yavi, Vemi Vikashel. Talmud Loma, Shuv, you might have thought, let's stop for a minute. You might have thought he can't bring but I me mean, from other people's money. But let's say he did. Let's say he collected money and he didn't take it out of pocket. Maybe it's okay. As ideally, he should bring it from his own. But if he does it from other people's money, it works. That's why it says a third time. Again, shuv means again. Remember, we learned that any time in Kodshim, in the world of Korbanot, it says something twice. This case happens to be three times, but... Here, relating to the Kohanim and his brothers, the Kohanim, it says it twice. So that means it has to be done that way. Meaning you absolutely cannot take money from anyone else for the sacrifice. It has to be only the coin's money. So now, this should be your obvious answer. Right? The, the person who pays, right? This is like in the world in general. You could say, look, I paid for it. I have rights. It doesn't always work, but right? and that's what we're going to see today. Just because you paid for something, does that mean you're the only owner of it, the sole owner? So he's, so the Gemara says, why didn't Rabbi Elazar just get his answer from here? If he's the only one who pays for it and it has to come from his money only, that must mean he's the owner and therefore Oset Mora, it's a Korban Yachid. It's not a partnership. There's no partnership agreement if they didn't put money down. Well, the Gemara says, can't be true what you're saying. Filitamech, and this is why Rabbi Elazar didn't learn it from here because you can't prove it. Because according to what you're saying, if they don't have any ownership rights at all for this korban, how on earth can they receive atonement for it? It must be that the, now here, Begaza, they translate as the Otsar, the Beit Otsar, the money, the treasure house, or really just it means here the money of the Kohen Gadol that went, that he took and bought this par. It's true he bought it with his own money, but it's not true what I said before, that just because you buy something, you're the sole owner. You could give it as a gift to other people. You could, right? Now, it doesn't here say a gift, but the Torah is mafkirit. That means, right, we've learned, we've, uh, we haven't learned it so much on this cycle, but it comes up a lot, this concept of hefker beit and hefker, which is 
the rabbis have the power, and here it's not even the rabbis, it's the Torah. They're saying the Torah, by taking this and saying the Kohen Gadol has to pay for it, but it also atones for all of his brothers, the Kohenim. That must mean that the Torah is saying, it's true you put the money down, Kohen Gadol, but your money is really ownerless at this point. Your money went to something that's now going to be jointly owned by all the Kohenim, in which case we're back to square one. Is this jointly owned or is this individually owned? So this one is siding on saying, no, you could say, right, they started by saying, it sounds like a Sherlock, he pays for it. That means it's only his. They say, no, you could understand it. Otherwise, right, there's almost like they're saying there's no real way to understand it other than saying that Afkare Rahmana, right? So hacha, gabet smura nami, we could say the same thing for substitution. Shani begaza da aron. It's true he paid the money, but it's different to Afkare Rahmana gabe achava koanim. The Torah made all of this hefkir, ownerless. Meaning they all, the Torah kind of passed on ownership to everybody, in which case we review it as a Korban Shutafim. Now it's not exactly clear from here if that's the Gemara's conclusion, that it's Korban Shutafut, in which case there are no laws of Tamura by this, or if they're just kind of bringing both sides, in which case we have no real conclusion to Rabbi Elazar's question. Because if you remember, they didn't bring this as an answer. They brought this to say, why did Rabbi Elazar even have a question? Shouldn't it be obvious from that Rasha? They say it's not obvious from that Rasha. So now either you say, because we totally accept the second reading, in which case we say it's communal, or, you know, again, it's not Seabor, but it is owned by a number of people, partnership, I should say, not communal. And then, or maybe it's just giving both sides and we still really don't know. Okay, we're done with that whole section. And now we start a new Mishnah on a totally different topic, which is how does the Kohen Gadol, what path does he take when he starts going into the Hechal? Okay, he goes into the Hechal and he's going with his spoon in one hand, his pan with the coals in the other hand, right? Spoon of incense, pan of coals. And now he starts walking into the Kodesh Kodeshim. I, it just reminds me, when I was in the Far East, I remember they, we, we, we learned about different temples and it talked about the temples and how the temples, there was a special way that you walked into the room. It was a whole thing, this whole idea about temples and how you walk in. There was a whole thing I remember in, in, in Vietnam specifically. You would never enter a temple, I think it was the Buddhist temples, in the middle. You'd always walk on the side. It's like you never walked into a room in the middle, always on the side. It's a whole, the whole logic to how you walk in, what does it have to do with? So we're going to see today, either it's a technical question or, right, like what's in the room physically in the layout and how can you possibly get there? Or maybe it's a, a philosophical issue. How do you enter the room of God? In what way? How do you keep respect to God while you're entering the room? How does it work? So we're going to see today. So he starts walking into the sanctuary until he gets to the two parochot, hamavdilot ben kodesh u ben kodesh kodeshim. I made a little diagram on the sheet. There's also pictures. There were these two parochot. Okay, now one, the first one. We'll get to this later, but the first one opened on the south side, had a little opening on the south side, and you would walk in through there. Then the other one, the inner one, had an opening on the north side. So you basically go in through the south, walk all the way to the north side. On the end of the north side was the opening of that parochet, of that second curtain. So there were two curtains that would separate between the sanctuary and the Kodesh Kodeshim. Ubenehemama. And between them was one cubit of space. We're going to learn about why this was in a minute. Rabbi Yossi Omer, lo parochet achat bilvab. What are you talking about? Again, we have this whole debate. What was exactly in the temple? He says, what are you talking about? There was only one parochet. One, not two. How do I know? Says in the Torah. Shnema. Vivdila parochet lachem ben kodesh uben kodesh kodeshim. And the parochet separated between the sanctuary and the kodesh kodeshim. What does it say in the Torah? Parochet. Parochet is singular. One curtain. So, the Gemara starts off and says, he's got a pretty good claim, Rabbi Yossi. What does Tanakama have to say to that? Shapir ka'amr le Rabbi Yossi le Rabbanan. He's got a verse. Seems very clear. So, Rabbanan Amrei Lecha, they will say, Hanemile be Mishkan. The Torah was talking about the Mishkan, not the Beit HaMikdash. We know there were a bunch of differences between the Mishkan and the Beit HaMikdash. Why? Let's see. Ava be Mikdash Sheni, Kevan de lo have amatraxin, u Mikdash Rishon hu dahave. That's in the first temple, there was an amatraxin. What is that? Not only in the Mishkan, also in the first First temple, there was a wall that was one cubit thick. Okay? Instead of these two parochot, there was a wall. In front of the wall was a parochet. Why did you need a parochet? 
because the wall, if you had a wall, there's no way to get into the Kodesh Kodeshim. The wall ended at a certain point. There was this opening, probably, as we're going to see later on the northern side. The paroche covered the whole space so that you couldn't see into the Kodesh Kodeshim when you were in the Hechal. You would open the paroche and go in through, the, through that opening in the wall. That wall took up an arm of space. In Bayit Shani, you couldn't have a wall there. Why? Well, you couldn't change the measurements of the space. You actually could change certain measurements. It talks about, there's a, and they, they quote a verse in, in the Nevi'im that say that the Bayit Hashini is going to be bigger than the Bayit HaRishon. And from that, they learn that the, 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 the measurements could be different. The, it, mostly they're the same, but certain ones can be different. The height, what did it mean? The height. The height of the Hechal was taller than the height of the, the, the Hechal and Bayit Rishon. Second temple. Now, once you have a higher wall, it was 30 cubits in the first and 40 in the, in the second. Now, here, I know I have some architects listening. So they claim that you can't have a one cubit thick wall for a 40 cubit high wall. In other words, you need more thickness. In fact, most of the walls were five cubits wide. So this one cubit is not going to work. So therefore, they had to do parochot instead of walls. So therefore, now... They had to have east of glue. The problem is now instead of this one cubit wall, you have a thin parochet. The problem is what's the space? Is the space considered inside or outside? Is it kodesh kodeshim or is it kodesh? And that's going to have all sorts of ramifications. What if the coin does the torah there? What if right? So what did they do? They closed off the area by having two parochot, one there, one there, and then everyone knew this was no man's land. It's not the echal. It's not the kodesh kodeshim, and that resolved it. So now they bring a bright with three opinions about how the Kohen Gadol walked. I'm sorry, I don't have the map in front of me, but you can all look at your maps or find some map. Also on the sheet, I have at least where everything is. And there's also pictures. You can find the link on the on the DAF, the, on the, on the DAF post. There's all the pictures there. You can see this all inside. He said he would walk. Now remember, the Mizbech is in the center when you walk into the room. The Mizbech is a half. On either side, on the south, you have the menorah. On the north, you have the shulchan. So now, you're walking in, you hit right into the mizbeach. So you have to go either left or right, right, either south or north. So what does he say? You would go between the mizbeach and the menorah. Okay, you would go on the south side. Rabbi Meir Homer, ben a shulchan the mizbeach. No, you would go on the other side, between the altar and the shulchan on the north side. The yesh omer, ben a shulchan la kotel. Some people say, oh no, there's a third option. It's really four, but they take the third, which is between the shulchan, the table, and the wall. There was space between the shulchan. It was a little bit away from the wall, two and a half cubits. You would walk that way. So first they start with the last opinion. Man yesh omrim. Who is this? Remember, Rabbi Yossi said there's only one parochet. And the parochet was on the north. Why the north? Because the north is always more important. Shchitatam bitzafon, the shchita of koche kochim goes in the north. The north is more significant. So the opening must have been on the north. In which case, you walk straight. This is going to be the quickest way to get there is going to be go north and just go straight along the wall and the opening, remember, is on the side. Of the opening of the parochet is on the south side. Um, uh, so just go one second. Right, I'm sorry, the north. I just said it wrong. On the north side, the opening is on the north side. So just go straight in through the north. Okay, that's the best, straightest way to get there. Rabbi Yehuda Omer Lecha Pitcha B'Darom Kai. No. The opening is on the south. Now, why is the opening on the south? Didn't I just say everyone agrees it's on the north? If you have two parochot, though, I told you, the first one's going to be on the south, and the second one's going to be on the north, so you're going to have to first go in the south. So because of that, we want to go on the south side of the room. Okay, now he doesn't say you go by the wall, but you go on the south side of the room, between the Mizbech and the menorah, and then you get, you're already on the south side, you move to the south there. Now they say, what about Rabbi, Rabbi Meir? Kiman Sfirale. He says... You take the path, right? You don't go along the wall, but you do go on the north side. So what did, who does he hold like? Ike Rabbi Yehuda Sfirale, Neok Rabbi Yehuda. If he thinks the opening's on the south, then go on the south. And Ike Rabbi Yossi Sfirale, Neok Rabbi Yossi. If he thinks like Rabbi Yossi, then go along the wall on the north. So why in the middle on the north? So we're going to give two answers. Remember we had this thing that Shlomo had these ten tables and ten minorot? If you have 10 tables and they line up north-south and they start at the wall, if they start at the wall, you can't walk between the wall. It's just practicality. There's no way to get there because they're up against the wall. So you have to walk between the menorah and the shulchanot. And as 
you still stay on the south side, you kind of you know, veer around them, but you can't walk against along the wall because they're blocking you. And then, so again, he holds like Rabbi Yossi that you want to go on the south, but you can't go along the wall, so therefore you go in the middle. The shulchan's blocking you. You can't get there. Alternatively, and then it's just technical. Alternatively, you could say the the, the shulchanot lined up north south. In which case, we're going to say then there's there's definitely space to walk along the wall because there's space between that and the wall. But what's the reason? And here's the more philosophical reason you can't just go straight in if you walk straight opposite you know you're walking along the wall and the opening to Kodesh Kodeshim is along the wall the whole time the Kodesh Kodeshim view is exposed to you it's true you don't see much of it but the ent- the entrance to Kodesh Kodeshim is exposed we don't want you walking straight in that's not respectful the whole time you're in the Echal you kind of already see in the Kodesh Kodeshim no we want you to walk toward the more centered in the room and therefore, when you're walking more centered, you then, you know, at the end, then you go all the way to the wall. So you stay on the south side so that you're closer to the entrance, but you don't walk along the wall because that's not respectful to God. So with that, we're going to end here for today. Um, I see just someone asked about the Kohen Gadol goes up the ramp. Or you, I'm not sure if I'm understanding the question, but obviously we're not talking about that part of the ceremony now. We're talking about when he carries this stuff and he walks. So he's going to walk along the, the, right, again, either the north in the more centered in the north, more centered in the south, or all the way along the wall in the south. Tomorrow we'll start with what does Rabbi Yossi say to that idea that we just mentioned that it's not respectful for the Shekhinah to walk straight in. Okay, with this we'll end for today. Have a great day, everyone.